Okay, recording's been set. So I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint. And uh, what I'm gonna do is just talk about the actual um, structure of the GAP reports first. Um, the GAP reports are found underneath the reports menu. There's a little subset that says GAP reports. And when you go to that subset, it lists the four GAP reports. Um, so GAP reports are only going to include capitalized assets. So for those items that have that capitalized status checked, um, those are the items that are going to be included on the reports. So districts will have a lot of items that aren't capitalized, that they're just you know, keeping for tracking purposes. Those items will not be included on the report. Only active quote items um, are included. So active uh, means that it's uh, active, um, new, uh, new or excess asset for sale and excess asset, asset not in use. Those are the four types of what they consider active items. Um, there is one um, exception here is the change schedules are going to include disposition transactions. So it will be including any items that were disposed of during the year um, on those reports. But the other reports are going to be including the active items. Um, separate report sections, um, you'll see that when you're running these gap reports, you're going to see um, like the fixed asset by source, you're going to be a section for governmental, for proprietary, for fiduciary, and possibly a section for unknown fund types. And we'll talk about um, those unknowns and other type of invalid, you know, type of messages that you're seeing on some of these gap reports. We'll talk about those when we get to each one of them. Items with a lease type of operating will not be included. So if you add an item to the items um, screen, and um, you have a lease method marked, and down then in the lease section, you mark that as an operating lease and not a capital lease. Those operating leases will not be included in the gap reports. Capital leases will. And also you'll see for each of these reports that there is going to be an include, exclude entity ID. Um, and what that is allowing you to do is um, allowing you to exclude, usually they're using the exclude portion, um, items that belong to a particular entity from the gap schedules. So what that means is let's say I have an item out there that is a lot of chairs, a big group of chairs. So um, if, you know, combining all the chairs together, um, it's over the threshold amount. But if I would go in and um, split those off to individual tags, they would all be under the threshold amount. If I want to, to avoid having to split them, I want to keep them in the lot, but I don't want them included on my gap schedules. On that item, there is an entity ID field where I can go in and put in whatever I want. Um, they can, you can label it whatever, like no gap, um, something like that. Um, that what happens then is when I go to run these reports and I want to exclude those lots from my gap reports, I can go in and underneath the exclude entity ID, I can put in that gap um, field or the entity ID name, no gap or whatever I use. Um, and so then those particular items will not be included on the gap reports. So that's what that include exclude is all about and that's in the documentation as well as well as described here as to what it as to what it does okay so i know a lot of people have questions about what is involved in the gap what's what's getting pulled in how is it know um you know what to report so what fields are used when um those gap reports are being generated so I have a table here of those different fields and what their definitions are and where they're coming from in the application. 
And so these are all playing a part into what's being pulled into the gap reports. Obviously, your gap um, flag needs to be enabled on the configuration screen. We showed you guys that yesterday. Um, so when a gap is enabled, this is what it's doing here. So it's looking at um, the fund. It's looking at the fund type. So it can put it in that particular section of the gap report. It's looking at the function and the asset class. So, and you can see over off to the right where those are being stored and um, where too, it's also in the transactions. So you've got a fund stored in the core funds, but that fund is also on the item. So it's, you know, looking at that to uh, put it in the right area of the report. Um, the status, and we talked about that a little bit ago, um, active um, are the ones that are considered um, that are being pulled in the reports with the exception of those disposition transactions on the change schedule reports. Um, the original cost, obviously. The acquisition method, is it when you created the item, did the user select purchase, donated, leased, or other? The lease type, so we just talked about that a little bit ago, capital versus operating. The depreciation information. So, you know, we've, we've got some depreciation reports. Um, the schedule of change and depreciation is going to be looking at the information on that item record uh, regarding the depreciation. Um, the acquisition information. Um, so the fixed asset by source is going to look at that. Um, change schedules are going to look at that. Uh, the disposition information, obviously. Um, so those uh, disposed of assets. Um, those are going to be um, listed as well and shown on especially the change schedule reports. Um, and the transfer info, any transfer transactions that were done throughout the year are also going to appear on the change schedule reports. So these are kind of the fields that are all played into that. And then um, we're gonna go into each one of these reports and explain you know, where exactly this information is getting pulled. So let's get started. Um, our first gap report is the fixed asset by source. So before we get started on this one, I just kind of want to show you guys again where all of this is located. So I'm going to go back here and go into my um, instance here. And so the reports are all listed here. And then here are the gap reports. So the first report that we are running uh, are going to go into is the fixed asset by source report. Not a whole lot on here. Um, here were those entity ID fields that I was talking about. If I want to include the report options as the first page of the report, I could check this. And then I just click on generate to generate the report. I'm gonna go back to my slides here. So if I generated it, this is what I'm seeing. So it's going to break it down. Like I said, all the gap reports like break it down by the uh, fund type. So my fiduciary, governmental, and if I had proprietary labeled, I would have that in here as well. In this particular instance, they don't have any proprietary funds. And so in here, um, what this is, is this fixed asset by source. That's the key word here, source. This is going to contain a summary of the original costs of all capital assets by their source, which is the acquisition method and the account code fund um, that was used. So, and then it's gonna pull that information into this report. So, you know, looking at this, the source fund code is the code that we use to purchase the item. So purchased items are listed by the source fund code from which the item was purchased from. I think I just repeated myself on that. So that is the actual fund dimension on the account code. So that's basically where you're gonna see all of this information here is the purchased information and the fund used from the account code on here. So this kind of shows you an example here of like where this is a part of the acquisition screen I have in here. 
And so this is basically showing 501 was the fund used for that account code. That's what it was purchased from. And so that is listed here, 501. So all of those um, capitalized assets that had a 501 account code that it was purchased from are going to be included on this row. So acquisitions, so these are all the purchase type of acquisitions. Other acquis acquisition methods, if we recall when you're entering an item, you've got the purchased, you also have donated, leased, and other. Those are gonna be displayed down here. So those other acquisition uh, methods are gonna be included in here. So like I said, these are all purchased up here. And then these are the other acquisition methods down here. Okay, so let's talk about how those purchased amounts appear on the report. And we did do some tweaking on this. We had some issues with this report, not pulling them into the right um, fund and stuff like that. So we've made a, a lot of um, changes and cleanup on this report. So I think it's pretty solid now as to where things are. It's mimicking what the classic EIS 101 report did. And so here's an example. So I'm providing some screenshots and I'm gonna go through these arrows with you guys. And so um, this is the acquisition screen up here, this top one. And so here's the account code that was used to purchase it, which it very well could be blank. Um, a lot of this information, you don't have to put um, the account that it, that it was purchased fund. If you're using the pending items to pull in, um, to create your item, it'll probably populate it with the account code used um, for the purchase. If you're creating an item without pulling in from the pending file and you don't put an account code in there, it's going to allow you. Um, a lot of classic work the same way. And so a lot of those items that were migrated over may not have an account code in the acquisition record. So again, you may see this a lot. Um, and so what's happening here is that this particular situation, if the fund dimension right here of the account code is blank or zeros, it is going to look for the asset fund, this guy over here. And when it goes and looks here, it's going to look at the asset funds fund type. So, it's the general fund. If I go to my core funds screen, that general fund is linked to the governmental fund type. So what's going to happen then is this amount of $1,000 on the fixed asset by source report is going to appear under governmental section of the report. But in the acquisitions prior to system startup because there is no fund identified here. So you guys are probably pretty familiar with seeing um, some of the district's uh, fixed asset reports in classic where their acquisition prior to system startup is a pretty big number. And that's because there is no identifiable fund code underneath the um, account code. And so it doesn't know where to put it. So it's going to put it in the acquisitions prior to system startup. So we did nothing to change that during migration. What it showed in classic is how it came over in uh, redesign. So, um, so that's why you're seeing this. It's because of this missing fund basically. So this is scenario number one. So again, if this is blank, it then looks at the fund. If there is a fund in here, then it's gonna go look at the fund type related to that fund. It's gonna put it in that proper spot in the report, but underneath the acquisitions prior to system startup. Next scenario, if the fund dimension of the account code is blank and the asset fund is blank, which Really, this is a case with classic migration data. Um, you're not able to create um, an item in inventory, you know, in the redesign now with a blank fund, it's going to require that. 
Um, so if so, if this is blank or zeros, and it's going to go look at the fund and it's saying, hey, there's nothing in here either, then what it's going to do then is it's going to list this thousand dollar amount into the unknown section of the report under acquisitions prior to system startup. So it, it, there's no fund here, so it doesn't know what to do with it. It can't put it in a, a proprietary, governmental, or fiduciary fund type because there's no fund type to it. So there's a fourth section of the report called unknown, and that's where it's going to put it. Again, it behaved like that in classic, and those amounts then migrated over into redesign. Now, if the acquisition does contain a fund dimension on the account code, and that fund dimension is listed in core accounts, or I'm sorry, core funds, um, what it's then going to do is it's going to display that fund right here, project fund 010, which is this one right here, it's gonna display that on the report under the appropriate fund type that that fund is listed. So this is exactly how it behaved in classic. So we're just mimicking the same behavior. So, you know, obviously because there's an account code here, it's, um, and that account code is also, I'm sorry, that fund code is here and that fund code is also underneath the fund um, options underneath core. It knows exactly where to put it on the report. My last scenario is if the acquisition does contain a fund on the account code, but that 010 is not listed underneath core funds, it's going to go to the fund, the asset fund, and it's going to look there, 001 general. So from there, then it's going to go look at core funds, find the general fund, and it's going to place it underneath that fund type that that general fund is tied to, the governmental, but it's going to label it with the fund code from the account code in there. So it's not in here. Um, so it won't have a description or anything. So instead, it's you know going to look at that fund from the account code and put it in here underneath the general fund because that's the asset fund it's tied to. So those are, you know, kind of how um, these amounts get pulled into these reports based basically on these four scenarios. It depends, one, if there is an account code or a fund dimension of the account code in here in the first place. And then two, is there a related fund or is this um, fund code also listed underneath core funds? So, and is there a government, is there a um, fund type related to it? So all of that kind of plays in these particular fields, plays into where those acquisition amounts are going to appear in the report. So, you know, if you ever do get a question from one of the districts saying, you know, I've got this amount in here. I don't know where this O and O is coming from. You know, can you help me out? You go to these slides and you reference this information. Um, and we'll probably put this somehow in the documentation as well. We haven't uh, done that yet, um, but you know, basically this is outlining, you know, what's happening behind the scenes. So any questions regarding that particular report? Okay, we're gonna move on then to the next report and I'm gonna go back. So we just went through the fixed asset by source. And now if I go to the fixed asset by function class, that's the next one I'm going to hit. And I guess the reason why I'm doing this in this particular order is I, you know, I knew classic and the 101 report was the fixed asset by source. The 102 report 
was the fixed asset by function class. The 103 report is the fixed asset uh, or the schedule of change in fixed assets. And the 104 in classic is the schedule of change in depreciation. So for those of you that you know, knew the classic reports, um, you know, I tried to put that in the PowerPoint as well and kind of link that together, um, at least for now. You know, after a while, those classic reports won't mean anything anymore. So, um, but that's why I'm kind of going in this order and kind of jumping around. Um, so for the fixed asset by function class, um, you're gonna have three different options. And I'm gonna take you back to the PowerPoint here. So there is a schedule by function and class option. There's a schedule by class, and then there's a summary by function and class. So, you know, the schedule by function and class and the summary by function and class are basically the two, the same report, um, but one summarized versus one is detailed. Um, so the schedule by function and class is going to subtotal it, uh, the report by function. And then within each function, it's going to subtotal then subsort by the asset classes within each function. So both, um, the original cost is displayed, there's a column for that, and the book value. So those are the two um, columns that are gonna be displayed on the report. And I'll show you um, this report here in a little bit. Um, the schedule by class is just subtotaled by class. There's no function sorting whatsoever. It's just subtotaled by each um, asset class. And again, it's going to show the original cost and the book values on that report. The summary by function and class, um, the way that that's laid out is that the asset classes are displayed in columns across the top of the report. And then off to the left, it's gonna subtotal by function. So you're gonna see those then, those amounts then by function um, in their appropriate asset class on the report. Um, there's an option to allow you to summarize by the first two digits of the function. So you don't have to see all the, the complete uh, detailed function codes. You can just subtotal by the first two digits of that function code. And then it has an option for you to either generate a book value to show the book values, or you can generate it um, using the original cost. So it will not include both on the report. You have to generate them separately. Um, so those are the three options. Um, the book value, if I haven't said it already, equals the original cost minus the total depreciation. That's the book value. Um, you may see some like invalid function or invalid class um, areas on the report and also undetermined section areas of the report. And this just identifies why you have those. So if you have like a, 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 an associated item has a missing function or asset class, and again, this is probably coming from something that was migrated over from classic, um, or um, they are actually missing underneath core, underneath the function and asset classes, um, then the amounts tied to those capitalized assets that are getting pulled under this report are going to appear under invalid. Um, so that would be, you know, something where if they do want to clean those things up, they, they, you know, were that way in classic, they came over that way in redesign. Um, and if they would ever want to clean those up, they can. If there's um, a missing function or asset class on the item, that's easy to find. You go into the items grid and you sort by you know the asset class column or the function column and find those missing empty uh, values. And then they can go in and do a transfer transaction to put them into the correct one. Um, also um, undetermined, if an item with any invalid fund type, their amount will appear underneath that undetermined section of the report. Doesn't know what, um, fun type to put it into, governmental, proprietary, fiduciary. So in a situation like that, um, you need to go and look at the um, funds underneath core funds and see what fund types are missing or invalid. They usually are just empty. Um, and then that's an easy thing to fix. You just go in and edit that particular fund that has a missing fund type. 
fill it in. Is it governmental proprietary fiduciary? Once you have that, rerun the report, and then that will move from the undetermined section into the proper section of the report. Um, so let's take a look at a few of these here. Okay, and what I've done in order to speed things up today, since I went way over yesterday, is I generated some of these already here. And so I'm going to first show you the fixed asset um, by source here. And this looks very similar to the screenshot that we already had. So here is, again, my sections of the report, my fiduciary fund type. And even if there aren't any, it's still going to show that section with all zeros, just to let you know there aren't any. Um, and then here is my governmental ones. So again, looking at some of these, I know right away that these are related to items that probably had, um, that either have a, a 001, uh, an actual fund dimension in the um, acquisition, um, and also has the same core fund. And so it gets labeled properly in the right section. Here's one 070, where I'm thinking this is one where it is not underneath core funds, but its related asset fund is tied to um, the governmental fund type. And so it's going to pull the 070 from my fund code on the account code and put it in here. Um, so again, this is where all of these are at. And then here's my proprietary. And then if I had any unknown in this situation, they don't have any that have any missing values. Um, so this is all zeros and it gives me a grand total. Classic reports didn't have the grand total. I find this so useful on these reports. Uh, because it's a very easy way to compare your fixed asset by source to another gap report, like your um, schedule of change in fixed assets. Those should balance because they all have original costs, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. This is basically what this fixed asset by source looks like. And then if I go in and look at these um, ones for the schedule by function and class, um, these uh, schedule by class and the summary schedule. Let's take a look at those. So I'm going to go ahead and this is uh, the schedule by function and class. So here is, again, like I said, this one, if we look back at our PowerPoint here, that's this one right here, schedule by function and class. I'm using, doing this option. This is subtotal by function sorted by asset class within each function. So if I go back, go back here is my functions subtotal by the asset class within each one. So here's a good example, the 1300. Here's my function code, all the asset classes underneath it. Again, these are, um, it's gonna show the original cost values and the book values on here. So again, here's my governmental, and then it's gonna go in and show me my um, proprietary, and they don't have any fiduciary, so that's not showing on here with my uh, fund totals. So if I pick on the next option underneath that report, uh, scheduled by class, let's say I wanna run it that way, this is what the report is going to look like. And like I said, it's just by asset class. There's no function showing on this one. And so a pretty easy read here. It just shows the different fund types again on the report and the asset classes uh, within that. And then the last one I wanna show you within that report is the summary schedule. And like I said, you have to either generate it for book value figures or run it again for original cost. And I have both down here. I'm just going to pick on the original cost one. The book value looks just like that one. But this is the one where I said the asset classes are in columns um, spread out the top of the report. So um, here is my different asset classes. And then it's going to list them. And I chose to summarize by the first two digits of the function. 
So that's what it's showing here. It's showing that, subtooling it by it, and then it's giving me that information. And again, these are all original cost values. Okay. Any questions about the fixed asset by function class report and its options? All right, I'm gonna go move on to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry, I did have an extra screenshot before we move on to the next one. This is just, again, showing, this is an example of where, um, you know, I was talking about some of those invalid messages and stuff that may appear on the report. So where is that invalid function coming from? It's not showing me the actual function code. And that's because the amount I'm seeing here is made up of three tags that do not have a function code on them. So, you know, if I add this up, it's that 6878. So that's why it's showing as invalid because there's nothing here. So again, an easy fix. I can go into the transfer transactions and assign the proper function code to these three tags. And then it will move this, um, it'll change this um, from invalid function to the proper function code. So, and then here's just another, this is the schedule of fixed assets by function class report. And this is the summary schedule, again, invalid function. So again, if you see that again, same thing, it's just a different report showing it. Um, then easily, this one is, is actually nice because it shows exactly the tags. So you can make those corrections. All right, schedule of changed and fixed assets. So, you know, we covered the first two gap reports. Now we're moving on to the change schedules is what um, we call them. And they're called a change schedule for a reason. It's because it's showing you throughout the report, the changes that have been made throughout the year for those capitalized assets. So the column format basically denotes the changes made um, to the original cost. So these are all, again, original cost amounts. You have three ways to generate these reports. You can generate a report by asset class, by fund, and by function. And again, it's going to split those out and section, section them out by governmental, proprietary, fiduciary, or possibly unknown, if there are. Um, you can generate a summary report, or if you check mark, um, it will generate a detail report. So when you think about this, within this option, you have a way to generate a summary report by asset class, a summary report by fund, and a summary report by function. And you also have the ability to generate a detail report by asset class, fund, and function. That's six different ways to generate the report. Um, so what's nice is when you go in and let's say you choose one, maybe by asset class, that seems to be the easiest one to read just because you probably don't have as many asset classes as you do fund and functions. So it might all fit onto one page. Um, so what's nice is that you can go in and run it by summary to see that summarized change that's taking place. And then the detail report, you can generate the detail report by asset class to see what items make up those changes on each of those columns on the summary report. Where are these acquisition amounts coming from, that acquisition column? Well, the detail report is going to tell me. It's going to show me the tags that make up those amounts. Um, so let's move into this so you can see what I'm talking about here. Here is a summary report um, of the schedule change in fixed assets, and I ran it by asset class. So we're going to talk about the calculations. Like I said, this is a change schedule. And so here is, I just took a quick a snippet of the first two asset classes, and we're going to talk about what we're seeing here. So here is my asset class, the 0100, which is land and land improvements. Here is my beginning value. This is my beginning balance. So again, these are capitalized items that at the very beginning of the year 
um, these were their values. Um, it's pulling those beginning balance amounts from those items. If you remember yesterday when we went into create an item and um, just to the uh, left of the original cost was a beginning value amount that's stored kind of on the back end and that is getting pulled in then into this column. So it's showing me at the beginning of the year, this is what I had from existing capitalized assets from the prior year, those came over. Um, and here are the beginning values for those existing capitalized assets. So this beginning value should really be balancing with the ending value from the prior year. Um, and we have made some great changes to inventory to ensure that those amounts in balance. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, so, and again, my dog is, is making some noises here. So if you hear that, he's um, busy sleeping here. Um, the acquisition amount um, is any new capitalized items that were entered during this year or additional acquisitions to existing items entered during the year. So if I created a new item and it exceeded the cap threshold, it becomes a capitalized asset, that original cost amount is going to appear underneath the acquisition. If I have an existing item that's already capitalized um, and I add um, an additional acquisition to it, then you know the original amount would be in here, right? Because it was already capitalized. And then that additional acquisition that I added to that existing capitalized item is listed here. So basically then the you know, original cost of beginning balance plus what I've done this year to that item um, are combined together basically and showing up on the report. So that's a good thing. Um, my disposition amounts are those that um, amounts of items that were part of the beginning balance but were disposed of during the current year. So it's going to take those off. So they're included in here, but now I'm subtracting that because I disposed of the capitalized assets. So it's going to show here. Um, my transfer in, um, so I did a transfer transaction from uh, one asset class to another. Um, it's going to show the transfer in amount in here and the transfer out amount in here. So if I um, did a transfer transaction out of the 001 into the, or out of the 0100 asset class into the 0200 asset class, um, then my transfer out amount is going to show it coming out of the 0100. And then the transfer in is going to show it going into the 0200. Um, so it's basically a wash, um, but at least it's showing um, giving an audit trail of what's going on. The adjustment amount um, includes amounts for any capitalized transactions which have um, the air adjustment flag. That's one way that amounts are going to show up in the adjustment column. So if I went in, and we talked about this yesterday a little bit, but let's say I went in and I created a um, an item or, or a disposition, we'll work with disposition transactions or something like that. And um, I created a disposition and it really should have been disposed of in a prior year. I created it this year. Um, and yeah, you certainly can do that. But if you want, and you know, it's a capital, you know, it was an item that was capitalized that you disposed of. If I want that to show in my adjustments column and not in my disposition column, because it really wasn't disposed of on this, this year's change schedule here. What I would do is when I'm creating that disposition, I would check the air adjustment flag. And when I check that then, that original cost amount of that item that I disposed of is going to appear here um, underneath the adjustment column to show that, yeah, it was a disposition, should have been done sooner, but it wasn't. So I want it to show as an adjustment because the disposition should have been done in a prior year. Um, also, I have here that this may also include amounts 
for items that have changed cap status during the year. So a little bit ago, I told you that we are trying to fix these reports so that beginning balance amounts would not get affected so that they balance with the prior year's ending balance. So we've done some work to these reports um, to ensure that any changes that are made are going to be reflected within the change columns here instead of the beginning value. Because if you're changing the beginning value, guess what? Your beginning value is no longer gonna match your ending balance from the prior year. And that is something that the auditors will definitely question. And they'll ask, why, why don't they? And so in classic, you kind of had to hunt and peck and try to find it um, in order to determine what items were causing this. And it was usually um, a change in the cap threshold. Um, that was the biggest one. Um, for the schedule of change and depreciation, it was because of a change in um, life to date depreciation was recalculated and stuff. And that made uh, and that affected things. Um, so we're trying to put a lockdown on that so that those type of changes don't aren't reflected in the beginning balance anymore. They're reflected mainly the adjustment column. Um, so I've got some um, examples here. So if I have an existing item that I added an additional acquisition to it. So that item was non-capitalized, okay? So it's not even appearing on this report, um, but I added an additional acquisition to it and it brought it over the capitalization thresh threshold. So it's now a capitalized asset. So in that type of situation then, that additional acquisition amount is going to appear underneath the acquisition amount here. And then the rest of that original cost of that item is going to appear as a positive adjustment. So now that item, that capitalized asset is showing up on the gap schedules. Before, it would affect the beginning balance. So, um, so we made that change um, I don't remember when or what JIRA issue it was, um, but we've made that change to where it's accounting for that in here. And what's nice is because you're making these adjustments, you know, underneath the adjustment column, um, then when you run the detail report, it's going to show those tags in there so you know exactly what tags are involved with these adjustments. So if I'm, if I'm like, where am I getting this adjustment amount from? Um, then I can go run the detail report of the same fixed assets by class and go in and look at that detail, look at the adjustment section and see all those tags. And if I go then and look at the tag, I can go in and say, oh yeah, I must have, and look at the acquisitions tied to it even, I added an additional item or acquisition this year that then brought this over the threshold. So that's why now it's showing as a capitalized asset. Um, so that is a really good way for either the district or their auditors to see why that's on there now. Um, what if instead of adding an additional acquisition to an existing item to bring it um, over the cap threshold, what if instead um, the capitalization criteria was run? Okay, and so that's an option underneath system. And so if the capitalization criteria was run decreasing the current threshold, so it was 5,000 and now it's 3,000. So I decreased it. Well, in that type of situation, now I've got items that, um, have, that were used to be non-capitalized that are now capitalized because I decreased it. Those are you know, being included now. So again, that could be a lot of items. So before, Classic would just adjust the beginning value and you would pray that the um, district saved their EIS cap report from Classic to back that up. Well, now instead of changing that beginning value, it's going to make those adjustments underneath the adjustment column. And again, you run a detail report, it's gonna show those. So you can see, you see a bunch of tags out there like, whoa, where are these all coming from? 
ah, um, then that's probably looking at it. They probably ran the cap threshold and that's audited as well. Um, and it changed that. Um, so that item that um, used to be um, non-cap is now capitalized. Um, so that's, you know, again, it's not affecting that beginning value. It's affecting that adjustment. So same thing too, when it comes to changing um, an asset from cap to non-cap. My last two um, examples were changing it to being capitalized. So in a case where you're changing it and it was capitalized, now it's non-cap. Um, obviously, again, if you create an additional acquis negative acquisition to an existing item, thus decreasing the original cost so that it's no longer a capitalized asset, then it's definitely going to show that additional acquisition underneath here as a negative amount. And then the rest of that original cost um, that was in the beginning value is going to now have an, a negative adjustment on it so that it basically takes it off. So, and same thing with um, the cap criteria. If the cap criteria was increased, which it seems like most districts increase cap, cap criteria instead of decreasing it. So if the cap uh, criteria was run to increase the current threshold, um, now you have some items that have now changed from cap to non-cap. I changed it from 3,000 to 5,000. Then those items that fall in between there are no longer capitalized, right? Because capitalization threshold's been increased. So again, those are going to the entire cost um, of the original cost of that item is going to show up as a negative adjustment um, because it, it was part of the beginning value, right? Because it was capitalized. Now it's no longer capitalized due to the cap threshold changes. So it's not gonna affect the beginning value. It's gonna make note of it in the adjustment column as a negative amount to take it off of your, your schedule change in fixed assets. I hope this is making sense. You're all going, okay, <laughs> I think I got it. Um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to explain, you know, what happens when there are changes made in the system, like a cap threshold change or something that changes the status of, of an item from either cap to non-cap or non-cap to cap. And I wanted to explain how that is um, done and how that affects um, these change schedule reports. And so I know we have one last issue that we're working on, I think on the next release, that's basically gonna cement this so that beginning values no longer get affected so everything is showing up on, you know, in the situations that I showed you guys on the adjustment column. So um, I think that will help immensely um, with comparing beginning values to the prior year ending reports, um, that that type of information, um, good, I'm glad that makes sense, Carol, that that type of information um, is going to stick and hold so that those ending balances always balance back to the beginning balances of the new year. Um, so yes, oh, crossing our fingers. It's a much easier um, transition this year. Um, okay. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is, um, because these first three gap reports we were talking about, those are all related to the original cost, right? Um, so in that, because of that, you should be able to match these up. So if you run a fixed asset by source, that total, grand total at the bottom should match any of the options you run from the fixed asset by function class. The original, you know, it's, you have to remember you're comparing the original cost on that. Um, all of those reports all have either original cost or it can be run by book value. So, so the total original cost on this report should match the fixed asset by source total, brand totals, which should also match the schedule of changed in fixed assets ending balance, those grand totals. 
those all should match up. And so what I've done is I have created kind of a snippet of each of these reports, just showing you what you're balancing. Um, and so I generated these three reports and I'm just took snippets of the grand totals. So here's my schedule of fixed asset by source, my grand total. And then here are the three different ways to run the schedule of fixed assets by function and class. This in the schedule, that by class in the summary schedule. So this amount should match those original cost amounts. Or if I run the summary schedule of fixed assets by function and class, um, there isn't a grand total. I'm not sure why. I might have to find out about that. But if I total up all these asset class um, amounts, it matches these other two. So again, this balance, these three balance back to my first report. And then my third report, summary schedule of change in fixed assets, whether you do the, the summary or the detail, those ending balances should match to my first two reports, um, the fixed asset by function class options or the schedule of fixed assets by source. So again, these should total up to here. So those should be balancing. So if a district asks, you know, can I balance, you know, these, I should be able to balance these reports, right? Because they're all original costs. You say, correct. You can go in and run these and those all should balance up. <clears throat> okay. So before we get into the depreciation, I did want to show you just the um, different options of the schedule change in fixed assets. So I'm going to go back in. And I am going to, uh, before I pull up the reports, let me show you what it looks like. And so in the gap reports, and I'm looking at this one, schedule change to fixed assets. Here's where I was saying you could select the type by fund, function, or asset class. And then your MCID fields, and then do you want a summary version or do you want a detail? So that's where I was saying you could get actually six different reports out of this, um, selecting these by summary and then selecting them again by detail. Um, and so I have already created two reports by um, a summary and detail by asset class. So let me pull those up. <clears throat> so a schedule of change and fixed assets by, and I'm gonna pick on the summary one first. So again, here is my summary. This is a great report just showing me what happened throughout the year um, based on asset class because that's the sort of option I chose. Excuse me. <clears throat> so again, just to reiterate, my be beginning values are coming from those existing capitalized assets um, that I had at the beginning of the year. I mean, it's reporting their original cost, their beginning balances. Anything that I have added this year that's a capitalized asset or took the asset over the capitalization threshold is going to be included here. <laughs> Anything I disposed of, capital, capital asset, the original cost is going to show here. Anything that I transferred from one asset class to another is going to show in these two columns. Any adjustments that I made, whether it was through an air adjustment or whether it was through a change in their capitalization status, cap to non-cap, vice versa, will show in here to give me my ending balances. So, um, so this information, like the beginning balance, um, these areas right here, and then this should show all of the detail as well. Now, obviously the detail report is not gonna show all the tags that make up the beginning values, it can't. Um, but it is going, that's not what it's designed for. It's designed to show you the tags that make up the changes in the year. What did I add? What did I dispose of? So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the detail report. <clears throat> Thank you. 
And so again, this is by asset class. And so looking at this, <clears throat> my land and land improvements, you'll see that it's got the tag, or aren't any in this one. We'll, we'll move down to building, so it makes more sense. Um, here I have two tags. Um, I have <clears throat> this capitalized asset that was disposed of, RE6000, that's the one we disposed of yesterday. Um, that sounds familiar. Um, so, and we did a disposition transaction. So it's showing up in my disposed of amounts. And so again, if I go back to my summary schedule and look at buildings at 24, 720, where is that coming from? That's coming from this. So it's coming from this tag. So that's where I can identify what makes up those amounts on my summary schedule. Same thing here. This one, I added an acquisition here for 33,000. Um, and so again, if I go back, I can see that amount right here. Underneath my O200s. And so the beginning balance um, is also reflected in the detail and the ending. So if I go back, here's my beginning balance and here's my ending. So basically, ooh, so basically you're taking the 28,000 or 28 million plus my acquisition minus my disposition to give me the 28,395 figure. And so it just goes on throughout the entire report that way, this up a little bit, and gives me the proprietary stuff as well. And then gives me at the end, the grand total is only gonna include the grand total for the changes that were made. It's not gonna include the beginning and end balance grand totals. So just something to keep in mind, whereas the summary report does. Um, but um, it's just gonna show me my total acquisitions, dispositions, so again, these figures here, 216 and the 24, if I go back to the summary, 216 and the 24 appear here. But like I said, the beginning and ending balances do not appear, the grand totals um, do not appear on that detail report. Um, so this is a great way you know, to compare the two. These should be in balance. So if somebody's asking my summary and detail reports, I ran by asset class are balancing. And we need, you know, need to look further into it as to why they aren't. Um, so, um, but they should always be in balance. Okay. Anything else I wanted to go with? Okay. Any questions um, regarding uh, the schedule change in fixed assets? Okay. We're going to move on to the schedule of change in depreciation. Now, right away, you know, this must be a different report um, because it says depreciation on it. It's set up very similar to the schedule of change in fixed assets, but instead of reporting original costs, it's reporting depreciation. So this is capitalized assets that are tracking depreciation are going to be included. Um, on this, and most capitalized assets are tracking depreciation. Um, so um, there might be some like land and stuff like that that may not be because land doesn't depreciate. Um, but you know, other all the other ones, vehicles, buses, things like that would be included on this report. So again, um, it's like I said, it's formatted the same way as the fixed asset one. You have the same sort of options, asset class, fund, and function. And again, we can generate a summary or a detail. <clears throat> so the um, columns are just a little different, um, uh, just basically um, one extra column that's basically been added to the depreciation one. So I generated a summary schedule by class of the depreciation report. And so, and I again, just took a snippet of the first two. So here's my description of that asset class. Here is my beginning depreciation. So the existing life to date depreciation as it was from the end of last year is going to show in this column beginning depreciation. And then any existing items that are being depreciated this fiscal year, considered the fiscal to date depreciation is going to be tracked here. So, you know, this column shows you, this is the depreciation as of last year. So basically this 
the beginning depreciation should balance last year's ending depreciation on you know, the prior year's 104, and that would be the life to date depreciation. So obviously, if the item isn't done depreciating, that fiscal to date depreciation is going to appear here. And then the rest of these are changes that are taking place throughout the year. So our acquisition amount is the, the depreciation for the current year for any new items that were entered, or again, additional acquisitions that caused it to go over the threshold amount or is already capitalized and just had an additional acquisition against it, um, that depreciation amount is going to appear in the acquisition column. Um, and then any items that were disposed of. So this is the total depreciation, life to date plus fiscal to date depreciation for any capitalized assets disposed of. So it wasn't here and now I disposed of it. I gotta get it out of here somewhere in some way. It's in the disposed of column. Um, the transfer in and transfer out, again, these are separate columns in here as well. So any transfer transactions that were done for items, their depreciation um, is going to show in the transfer and the transfer out. And then the air adjustment, total depreciation for any items that had a transaction posted with the air adjustment. Um, the depreciation is going to show in the air adjustment field. Also, what I just went through showing you guys um, on the schedule change in fixed assets when I discussed um, how capitalization threshold may affect um, the balances and stuff like that, it's going to behave the same way with the depreciation figures too. So again, if I went in and created the, you know, changed the capitalization threshold and increased it, any items, capitalized items that are tracking depreciation, their depreciation differences are gonna get accounted for in the air adjustment so that it does not affect the beginning depreciation column. So that way, beginning depreciation will balance the prior year's ending depreciation. Um, so, you know, it's gonna behave the same way. Um, and I will add that to the documentation. I know that's kind of confusing because, you know, you have a district, you know, asking where are these air adjustments coming from? Again, run the detail report and it will show you that, but um, why again, I will put in the documentation um, so that that makes sense to everyone. So again, beginning depreci depreciation plus continuing items, um, plus acquisitions, minus dispositions, plus minus transfer ins and out, and plus or minus any air adjustments, depending on if it was a positive or negative adjustment, will equal your ending depreciation balance. So schedule change in fixed assets has original costs. Schedule change in depreciation has the depreciation if the capitalized asset is tracking depreciation. And before we talk about this, I want to run a couple and show them to you. <clears throat> and so um, let me get rid of these other two. So this is the schedule of change in depreciation by asset class. That's how I created it. And so again, here's my beginning depreciation figures. So that's basically the life to date depreciation from the prior year. And so that's my beginning depreciation or the ending balance of this report from the prior year. Any existing items, um, capitalized assets that are currently tracking depreciation for the fiscal. So this is fiscal to date depreciation. Here are my acquisitions. So these are items that I acquired this year being tracked for depreciation. This is basically their depreciation figures. My disposed of ones, like I said, this would be the depreciation amount, full depreciation amount, uh, because it wasn't here. Now it's being pulled in and subtracted in this column. Any transfer ins and out, any air adjustments to give me my ending balance. 
So summary reports laid out by the different sections. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull the uh, detail report. So again, so these are the actual items that make up those changes that were made throughout the year. So these are the tags. So again, if I wanted to find out why, um, you know, this is in here, then I could, you know, why the summary report is reflecting it. It's because of this particular item. So in this case, it looks like that was fully disposed or that was fully depreciated. So that's why the 24720 that matches the original cost because um, it was a fully depreciated item. So their life to date depreciation matched their original cost. So, um, but yes, so going back here, I want to go to the summary 7420. Where is this coming from? It's coming from this item. So again, um, it does give totals. It doesn't give like the beginning and ending balances on the detail report like it does the um, schedule change by fixed assets here. It just gives the actual totals. It was probably because the EIS 104 worked the same way. So we mimicked that in here. Um, but it does give you all the totals here. Again, these totals should match by asset class the totals that are showing on the summary report by each of those asset classes, and it does. Like I said, it's not displaying beginning, continuing, or ending on the detail report, just these columns here. Okay. Well, now that I really have your head spinning here, <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, especially these last two reports, this, the change schedules. Um, so please feel free to go back to the recording and listen to these as many times as you want to get a good handle on them. All right, going back to the PowerPoint here. So when it comes to balancing then your depreciation reports, you know, you've got the original cost, those first three gap reports, you can balance to each other. Um, but when it comes to depreciation, um, the book value can be balanced, um, but you have to use the, you know, the actual book value report to do that. So um, the grand total for, fund, for all fund types should match when, if you run the fixed asset by function and class by book value, any of them, um, by book value column, that should match the book values book value column. Those should agree as long as you're running the book value for capitalized assets that are active, okay? The schedule of change depreciations ending balance should match the book values total depreciation column. As long as the book value, again, is for capitalized assets for active items. So those should balance. That's if you know you have a district asking, how do I balance my 104? Sorry, my not 104, my schedule of change uh, and depreciation. How do I where do what do I balance that to? Um, they can use the book value, but they have to be careful that they're running the book value for capitalized assets. If they don't, it's going to include all those non-cap and make that you know report much larger. Um, so they just have to be careful about that. And I have a screenshot um, to get, kind of give you guys a visual. I'm all about visual when I'm dealing with these reports. Um, so um, the book value figure should match. Here is a, the schedule of um, the fixed assets by function class reports. And I'm focusing on just the book value portions of that. So I ran it all three ways. Um, and so here are my book value figures. So these are all capitalized assets. And again, I had a total up this last one, but that matches these two. And then my schedule of change and depreciation, I ran it all three ways by fund function and asset class. And again, when I look at that, um, 
I can't compare book value on the schedule change and depreciation because it doesn't have book value, um, but the book value report does. So I have to go and make sure that the amounts I see on the fixed assets by function and class, the book value column matches, and I got an arrow here, to the book value reports book value column. And again, make, making sure I'm running this by capitalized assets. <clears throat> and so those balance. And then my ending depreciation on the schedule changed by depreciation, that ending balance should balance my total depreciation. And also like my original cost that's sitting here on my book value, that should match my schedule change in fixed assets or my fixed asset by source. Those all should match too. That's another way to compare um, to make sure that things balance. Um, and I do believe we are working on a way to compare the beginning depreciation on these to um, the life, yeah, to the book value. We have a JIRA issue. Um, yeah, it's somewhere listed here. Um, yeah, JIRA issue 344. Um, I don't think that's currently scheduled yet, but that's going to allow you to enter in a disposition date range. I know people have been asking about that for the book value. Um, and so when that is available, that'll allow you to further um, compare um, some of these amounts from the schedule change and depreciation with the book value. Um, but until that gets done, so you can just select depreciation figures, um, that, that's you know, not available at, at this time. Okay, so yeah, another good one just to kind of review and then to run and see, you know, you're getting the same thing, just running these reports yourself and just making sure that I'm getting this. I see where these are coming from now. Okay, that concludes our gap reports. I feel like we all need to take a break. <laughs> but I, I wanted to get into those in detail. Um, and like I said, when we record, you know, after we record this, um, <clears throat> they will be segmented out into chapters so that you can just learn about the fixed asset by source report, or you can just review the schedule change um, and depreciation. Um, so you don't have to go through the whole thing. Um, so that, that will help as well. I'm going to go back <clears throat> to, and I know I, you know, kind of didn't, you know, actually show you these a whole lot, but there's not a whole lot on these gap reports here as there are with the non-gap reports. But again, the fixed assets, um, Schedule change report showing this. And if I would go in and select the schedule change and depreciation, it's the same thing. You almost feel like it didn't change, but it did because the name changed up here. But all the different fields are the same. So those are the four gap reports. So what we're going to get into next are not all of these non gap reports, but some of them. Um, and we have done a lot of work on improving these reports, especially the book value. That seems to be the one um, that we've been working on the most, but we've been trying to um, add different sort and subtotal options and stuff. And I know we still have some JIRA issues out there um, regarding these two, um, but these are all the different non-GAAP reports that we have. And like I said, I'm not gonna get into all of them, but just to kind of touch upon them here, um, the audit report we will be getting into in a little bit. And so that's basically generating a report of, um, you know, the systems auditing, um, being able to select like a certain tag number or a date range or a certain area, like just the items information and being able to generate a report. So it shows system-wise, you know, when things occurred. Um, the asset, last, asset listing by grant source, so this is very similar to, um, this is basically showing the acquisition information. 
um, so on transactions, acquisitions, if you want to see that information in a report, then you're going to be similar to it. Um, you'd want to use the asset listing by grant source. The book value is, um, like I said, we just kind of showed you a little snippet. It's got, you know, the actual book value of it, uh, original cost minus total depreciation, and also um, the fiscal to date depreciation, the life to date depreciation. It's got, a, you know, the original costs, it's got a lot of information on there. Um, so we're going to uh, dig into that one a little bit deeper here in a little bit. Um, the brief asset listing report, um, this used to be the EIS 304 report in Classic, a great little uh, report because it summarizes things. We've been trying to add more sort of subtotal options to this one as well. But if you just want a uh, one-liner of each item uh, with the probably most popular fields, um, then that's the report to use. Uh, code listing is just, um, that was the EIS 001 report in Classic. And that is just showing you all of your different core um, codes in a report. The fiscal year ending balances report, we'll get into this a little bit um, at the end today. We're going to talk about a couple of the fiscal year end reports and the fiscal year end report bundle. Lease asset is just what it says here. So for those items that you are have marked with a lease method, um, capital or operating, those will be included on this report. Location is pretty self-explanatory too. Where are these at? Um, so this is a popular uh, report for those um, for districts um, to give to their teachers and people that are in charge of certain areas of that portion of the building um, so that they can review and make sure those things are still there or go and search for where they were moved to. Um, so you can, you know, page break this by location and pass these out um, to those to, you know, staff. Um, pending items list report. So yesterday we went over pending items. So if you want a report of what's listed on the pending items grid, you're going to run the pending items list report. We'll talk about the depreciation posting report too. It's another one of those fiscal and reports here in a little bit. And then the user listing. Um, so this is a listing of all the users that are on the system um, that have user accounts. Um, so that's under system users. If you want a report of that, you run this. So those are the reports that we have added right now. Now, um, I know that we have had people asking about um, the ability to generate CSV or Excel file options for reports. Absolutely. Um, that is something that we definitely have. Um, I think it's, let me look here. It's your issue 430. Um, and so people are wanting to take these and wanting to create a spreadsheet of, you know, the, the brief asset listing or the location worksheet. They want those options because right now, when you run any of these reports, and I'll get into like the brief asset listing here real quick, um, it just says generate. You know, if you're, you know, in USAS and payroll, you have different options, output options, PDF, um, you know, CSV and stuff like that. So we will, you know, we are totally aware of that. And as time permits, we'll be able to um, add those options on um, those other output files. Okay. I think we're good. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> being a little creative when it comes to these because um, we just have that PDF option and not a spreadsheet option. Or maybe when you're looking at some of these non-GAAP reports and they don't have a certain field on there to sort by, uh, we need to think outside the box a little bit. Um, and so, or maybe this report isn't even available. It didn't come over from uh, the migration. Uh, what I can think of right away is insurance values report. Um, we definitely checked with the focus group when this all started um, in terms of certain things that are used and not used. And one being um, the 303 report, which was the master listing report. Um, you know, is that one used? Are the auditors using that? You know, things like that. Um, can we get those same reports or information 
um, from those reports out of inventory in another way. And a lot of these can be done using the grids. Um, if you want a spreadsheet report um, for, you know, uh, for locations and stuff like that, um, those are options that um, can be done in there. So that's one thing to think about if, you know, you're running the brief asset listing and it doesn't have a certain sort that you can select, then think, okay, the brief asset listing is the item information. If I go to the items grid and I filter on what I'm particularly looking for, I can use the export grid items option to export it out into an Excel spreadsheet, sort it, make changes to it as I need, and I have the data that I need. So it's not in the report, you know, that the PDF, but it's in a spreadsheet that um, may work better, you know, for some, uh, for some people. So that's just kind of one little tip is I just wanted to, you know, say, think outside the box sometimes if that certain option isn't available. Um, obviously, you know, I know we do get tickets asking for certain things to be added and we do create feedback issues, but those get done as time permits. And this thinking outside the box and creating an extract is a workaround that they can use um, until, you know, those get um, added to the software. So like I said, we are continually making report improvements, you know, and you feel free to review our outstanding JIRA issues about the reports uh, that we have out there. Um, I know we had a couple other here. Let's see. We have um, people wanting to, the, to add the vendor name and number to the pending item report. We already have an existing issue for that. Um, like I said, the ability to generate this uh, CSV or Excel data format in all the reports, we've got an issue for that. Um, and then we do have some bug fixes too that we still need to take care of. Uh, the wrong time zone is being is showing. Um, so we need to update that to Eastern Standard Time. So we've got an issue for that. So, and then we have um, some feedback issues as well. So please feel free to review those um, to get a better, better handle. And if there is one out there that you don't see and you've had several requests and there's not a workaround for it, um, please create a ticket and then you'll create a your issue for that. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of these non-GAAP reports. And the first one I wanted to point out is the audit report. Um, and so this is just a screenshot of the audit report. And um, with that, we uh, have an option that they can generate a demand and an official. And so um, those were the same options available on the audit report in Classic. So really the only difference that I'm seeing on these two reports is that the official generates a signature block at the end of the report so that the treasurer can sign off on it. Um, otherwise, it looks very similar or the same to the demand report. The demand report can be run as many times as they need to. That's the default option anyway. So um, you can go in and enter um, specific tag number. Now, the one caveat to that is that it's still going to make you put in a start and ending date, even though you put in one tag. I do know we have a JIRA issue for that because I noticed that and I said, oh, I just want everything. I don't care when this tag was created. I just want to see everything regarding this tag, whether it was created five years ago or not, because I don't know when it was created. So. Right now, I just put in a really old date to, you know, uh, the current date in order to get the information I need for that tag. But again, we are going to make a change so that if you put in a tag number, it's not going to require a start and stop date. Um, selecting the report type, I've got an arrow here of all the different options that can be um, selected from. And so if I wanted to see um, any changes made in the system that affected the fiscal year, then I, um, the fiscal year uh, underneath core, then um, I could choose fiscal year. If I wanted to go and, you know, see anything that affected my items, I would select the items. So 
I made a little note here that says this is not limited to actual menu options. And what I mean by that is I have an example here. Um, if you updated the replacement cost on an existing tag via a spreadsheet import, um, you can't select by what happened um, via the import option. So I can't go, I don't have an option here that says I want to find everything that was done when I use the import option. That's not an option to select on. The replacement costs are stored on the item record. So it changed the replacement costs on the item record. So in order for me to see those changes on an audit report, I would need to select item. And then it will, when I, once I generate that report, it will show me those items with the, you know, my um, old uh, uh, replacement cost and then my new replacement cost. So that's just something to, you know, keep in mind. It's not really per a menu option that you can select on. Um, it's per what's happened in those storage areas. Um, and what got affected. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to um, pull up an audit report that I ran earlier, and we're going to take a look at some of the things we did yesterday. I think I have a list listed here. So here is, it always um, gives you the, um, my options that I chose. And so I purposely put yesterday. I wanted to see um, whether it was added, modified, whatever. That was my operations were all. And then I um, selected all objects. I could have just selected items if I wanted to. Um, but, you know, obviously it's sorted by date. Um, really, because I only selected yesterday, I guess that wouldn't have mattered too much. Um, if it was a specific username, I could do that as well. Um, but what I'm going to do is I am going to search here. And I am going to find, I added tag 9991 yesterday. That was one of them I did. So I'm just going to do control F to search for 9991. <clears throat> and it's going to take me, found it five different places here. And so the first place it found it, um, this is what the audit report looks like, is, and I can see right away when this item was entered yesterday at 10.02, we were all together, um, who added it, which I logged in underneath the admin. Um, what did I do? I added an inventory item, tag number 9991. And so here it's giving me all of the fields basically that are stored in the item record and what happens to them. And so the old value is there wasn't anything because it's a new item. And now here's all the new value and it's showing the um, information that was added when I added that item. So I'm going to go ahead and go to next to find the next one. And 9991, yep, 9991, that makes sense. And then down here, after I got through everything that was added on the item record, I also have to remember when I create an item, it also creates the associated acquisition. And so again, it's going to be the same timestamp. And this time I'm adding it to the acquisitions, same tag number, and then it pulls and loads all that information into the acquisition record. So that's three, four, and five. So those are the five different places it found it. So again, I can look to see, I didn't have an acquisition record before, now I do. And this is all the information that was added to it. So clearly this is showing me that when I created 9991 yesterday, it created an item record and it created an acquisition record. So that's one way. Let's pick on another one here. Um, we did a split yesterday. We split it. Um, we split uh, item into eight different items, and it was two four zero seven eight. So let's take a look at that. One. And found uh, six different um, times here. 
And so the first one here that I'm seeing is it's saying it deleted, um, here's the item, 24078. It deleted an acquisition. So let's think about this. That item was, I think like 5,500 or something like that. And we went and did a split on it to divide it out eight different ways. And so you think about the item, it also had acquisition records, right? Tied to it. And looking at this, if I scroll down, there's two of them. So here's the first acquisition that um, it, it deleted that acquisition on the back end. It deleted it because I'm going to be basically, when I split, it's changing this number and it's changing the value um, to you know what it is when it's divided out eight different ways, right? So it's going to create a new acquisition against it just for that particular portion. So it's deleting the two existing acquisitions. Here's the first one for 34.50. And here's the second one, deleting it for 2070. And that, that makes that equals that you know, $5,000 figure I was talking about. So those two are deleted. And then the item was modified. So, and if I kind of look down here, so again, if I total up these two amounts, it was 5520, okay? It's going to update the original cost because I split it out eight different ways. Um, and I kept this tag number, obviously. That's like the first tag that it split out into. It needs to update the original cost from 5520 to the 690. And so it's just showing me, you know, what changed replacement costs and insurable values were updated as well. So the life to date depreciation was updated. So it's showing everything that was changed. And so it's showing me those first two depreciate or first two acquisitions being deleted, the item record tied to it being changed. Where's the acquisition now? It created a new acquisition for that tag, add acquisition. And here again, for the 690 amount. So now if I look up that tag, it's for 690 and it only has one acquisition against it for 690. Um, and that's it. That's what it did for that tag. And then if you scroll down, here are the other tags that were um, added when I did the split. So I added this inventory item. So it's going to, you know, show me that. And I'm probably going to get an acquisition tied to it and so on and so forth. So it's going to show all the information from that split as to what happens. So again, that's another good thing to point out is that when I'm going in to run the audit report, like I said, it's not by option. So I can't say, I want to find everything um, that I used to split for. That's not an option, but my items record is an option. And it, when I generate it for that, I can do a search and find what changed on those items. Okay. I'll find one more here. I know we did a disposition too. Yeah, RE6000. So here is where um, I disposed of an asset yesterday. I disposed of this tag. And so again, it's showing me what happened. So when I dispose of an item, it doesn't delete it. It changes the status of that item to just from active to disposed of. So this tells me right here at this time, um, the item record was modified and it's this tag and then it kind of jumps down to the next year, but it's showing me the item status was changed from active to disposed of. And there is a little behind the scenes field here, disposal date that's tracked on the item record apparently. Um, it was empty and now it's showing that value of the date that it was um, disposed. So that's the item update. Well, obviously I created a disposition transaction. So that's gotta be on here as well. And so that's this one right here. I added a disposition for this tag. And obviously there was nothing there before. Now it fills it in that disposition transaction with all that data. So that's kind of how to read uh, basically an audits report. Okay.
Any questions? We'll move on. And I wanted to get into uh, the book value. Um, and I know we've kind of touched upon it a little bit already, but it sure, certainly doesn't hurt to go into a little more details here. Um, and the book value contains depreciation information for items that are marked for depreciation. So they have to be marked um, in order for them to be included. So um, the book value is um, going to include capitalized or non-cap. You can select both or you can select either or. Um, so uh, the sort options, um, you, if you choose to sort by fund, fund type, function, or asset class, we just fix this, that the report will automatically subtotal for those sort options, or I guess we made an improvement to it. Um, before, you know, people were wanting to, um, you know, sort by asset class, well, it was just showing all the items, but it wasn't giving a subtotal. So um, we've updated that so that those subtotals are also there as well. Um, I'm going to go and look at the, the uh, report real quick. Here is the book value. And so you can see you have a lot of different options in here. Um, you've got, you know, where you can include and exclude entity IDs. We'll get back to the fiscal year here in a little bit. Um, select by specific tag numbers, by different fund types, governmental, fiduciary, fiduciary, all those, by certain funds, by the statuses. Here's where the capitalized comes into play. If you want to try to balance this to a gap report, you have to make sure that the capitalized is selected. Your different um, amounts, what do you want to show? And then your sort options. And here's the things that we enhanced lately. And if I, like I said, I select those certain fields, it's also going to subtotal on those because it makes sense to subtotal by an asset class. Subtotaling by description doesn't make much sense, but asset class does. Um, so um, going back to the fiscal year here, go back to my PowerPoint, you'll see that it defaults to whatever the current year is. 2023 is my current year, it's gonna populate that in there. So if I have fiscal year 22 open and 23, but let's say 22 is my current year, it's gonna display 22. And when I run the report, um, it will include items with acquisitions up through the end of 22. So if I've done some 23 processing already, it should not pull those in because my current year is 22. Um, so life to date amounts will be up through the end of 21 because I'm in 22. Um, fiscal to date will include depreciation up through 22. So it's we've had to make some uh, changes and tweak a few things to get this to work properly, but it should be working that way, depending on, you know, what your current year is that you're running it for. And like I showed you guys a little bit earlier in that one screenshot, you can take that book value and you can um, compare it against a fixed asset by function class if your book value is run for capitalized assets. And also a schedule of change and depreciation. You can balance it against that as well. So it will allow them to do that. Um, and before we move on to the next, I do want to show you a book value here that I did generate. Mm -hmm. Let's go and delete that. Let me try that again. Um, so I ran this book value, and it looks like I sorted it by asset class here because I see subtotals here. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of information on this, and it was a challenge to get everything in here because I know we did have a couple fields that were missing from the classic report. And I believe we've added those on since then. Um, but here you kind of have to read it. Here is my first asset class. Here's my first tag. Um, here's the tag number in the description. 
And then here is where I start, you know, looking at this is my function code, the asset class, which obviously should match this. My location, if I had an entity ID for it, um, the method, is it tracking? And if so, which it, it should be, should have something because the book value should be all of your depreciable assets. Um, straight line. Um, the beginning date is my beginning depreciation date, not the acquisition date. Um, the life, if it had a life here, so here's all my life figures. My original cost, um, any salvage values that I had. Um, then my life to date depreciation. So life to date plus my year to date, which is the fiscal to date current depreciation, should equal my total depreciation. So like I said, if you're running this at the end of the, you know, running this and um, you're comparing it against your schedule of change in depreciation, um, you wanna look at the total balance, um, the total depreciation, uh, because that's the, what the ending balance includes on that gap schedule. My book value should be original cost minus total depreciation depreciation equals my book value. And then it's just got some informational columns that came in from the classic report, what percentage has been depreciated so far, and then the last year of useful life that I will have. So obviously this one has not been fully depreciated yet. Um, and I can tell that immediately because I started it in 2008 and it's gonna take 30 years for it to depreciate. So the last year of useful life should be 2038. Okay, that's basically how to, you know, read the report through here. And then there should be a total, grand total at the very end, yes, as well. Okay, we're wrapping things up here. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, um, and I know we talked about report bundles yesterday a little bit, but just to reiterate that again, um, is that you know we do have a report bundle option out there right now um, that will generate a zipped file of reports when the period is closed. So it gets triggered then, and but that depends if there's been any setup done. So it's gonna create a zipped file containing several fiscal year end inventory reports in a PDF format. Um, and as long as the configuration information down here has been taken care of, then it's gonna email that to the um, designated email addresses underneath core configuration. So the email configuration needs to be done here. And then, um, the email addresses need to be entered in here. Um, so all of the detailed information about the fiscal year and report bundle is included in the chapter. It, it shows all the different reports that are listed. Like I said, I think there's like 26 of them. Um, we have had some issues with the audits report. We're not gonna lie, um, it's a big one. And so that was causing some issues with the fiscal year report completing um, the bundle. Um, so I'm getting emailed out, it was just too large. And it's usually was because of the audit report causing the issue. So we are, we have made some improvements. We're still making more. Um, we're trying to figure out maybe different solutions. And one of those, um, is the document store. Now, I you know we've talked about that a little bit. Um, but um, the document store is a way to look at your, or really filter your archived reports out there in your SAS and payroll. We're gonna have a really neat way for you to filter them in those, in, in those applications um, to look for specific things. Um, so the document store kind of works behind the scenes. Well, one thing that we did not do is we did not create a file archive for inventory um, because we knew the document store was coming. Um, so right now there isn't a way to like view archived reports in the inventory application. You have to view the zipped fiscal year and report bundle. Um, so our plan is, is that we are going to allow document store when the fiscal year and report bundle 
gets generated, gets triggered to generate, it will send those to the document store instead of through an email. Yay. Um, and so then there will be a way to retrieve that information. I don't know all the details as to how that's going to play out, but that's the plan. And I believe that we're hopeful that it's in place um, before fiscal year end. Um, so that that's in here. I know document stores real close, um, you know, to being released here within, you know, the second quarter of the year um, is when it's projected uh, to be available. So we're hopeful that this inventory uh, report bundle here will be something that can be immediately sent to that instead and be able to be retrievable. So um, one other thing too that we've had questions on is will document store allow us to also take our archived EIS CD reports and put them in, in, and uh, store them in there? Yes, as well as your prior year inventory report bundle, zipped bundle. So if you you know had districts close out and redesign, and they have those report bundles sitting out there somewhere in their documents folder on their laptops, they'll be able to take those too and import those into the document store. So um, I don't know all the details um, of how that's gonna work, but um, that is you know, what the plan is, is that that stuff will be tied to the document store. Any questions on that? Hi. Okay. Well, what I'm going to touch upon real quick before we wrap things up here, great news on the document store options. Yes, I mean, yeah, I'm excited about it too. I'm excited about the whole thing and how it's going to look in USAS and payroll too. And how, you know, you guys are going to be able to easy, easily query, you know, stuff on archive reports. It sounds like it's awesome. So I can't wait to see it as well. Okay, I'm going to exit out of here. And go back to my. Clicking on the wrong thing. There we go. And just a couple other fiscal year reports besides the report bundle. Like I said, um, the report bundle, you know, you have some configuration needs to be set up underneath core configuration and underneath system configuration. There is an email configuration that needs to be done. Um, in order to get that stuff set up properly. Just two other fiscal year and related reports that are uh, out there that are included in the fiscal year and report bundle. And we will touch upon those more when we go through the inventory fiscal year and closing. But we do have a fiscal year and balances report and we do have a depreciation posting report out there. So, um, and I do have, I think it was in here. Here's the example of the depreciation posting report. Not a whole lot to it when you run the reports, but a whole lot of information on the reports. So this depreciation posting report um, is what replaced the EIS closes EIS DEP report. And so it's basically, it's always sorted by fund here. Um, and it's showing you the fund description. And then it gives you some good information here. It's going to show you the depreciation for all items, whether they're cap or non-cap, listed here by fund, and also the book value. That's original cost minus depreciation. It's going to give you that. And then it's going to give you another subset for just capitalized assets, depreciation for just capitalized and the book value. So that's what that report is. And it's a projection. It's what, you know, at this point, if you're running it, what it looks like. Obviously, that's going to change the more pro transaction processing you do, um, but that's basically where it's at right now, your projection. And same thing with the other report here that's fiscal year end related, and that's the fiscal year end balances report. That is the actual EIS close.txt file in Classic. And so this one breaks it out by fund, function, and asset class. And it's just showing you the ending um, balances on here. Um, yeah, and so it's going to show all of that information and give you the total here. 
So again, this is a projection. So these are the original cost balances. Um, so obviously if you do more processing, you know, then these figures are gonna change. So that's why we made sure to label these as projection reports. So these are things that can be run before they close the year. So they can kind of compare stuff, make sure everything looks good. Um, and then obviously then they close the year that generates the report bundle. And these reports will then be on the report bundle. Okay. Well, I believe that's all I had for today. So we covered the gap report, some of the non-gap reports. Um, some of the fiscal year end related stuff. So I think um, this will be um, a really great way, you know, once we get this sectioned out into different chapters that you guys can then um, share that information um, with your districts and have them go through some of these um, different areas of the report. So I appreciate, I know we ran over it again. I promise tomorrow we won't, right? So tomorrow we're gonna to go through depreciation and talk about that. And uh, otherwise you guys have a great rest of your day.